Hello, BookTube, and welcome to week one of our mandatory read-along of Jane Austen's 1813 novel, Pride and Prejudice. Uh, mandatory because uh, this time around, all month long, I'm not going to be saying those of you who are following along because you're all following along. Because you have to. Because this is mandatory. <laughs> so we are rereading, or in, in the case of the lucky, lucky ones of you who've never encountered this book, reading Jane Austen's beloved novel, Pride and Prejudice. We're doing 15 chapters a week. That's not much. I'd be willing to bet, especially those of you who've never encountered this before, I'd be willing to bet that that's going to feel like, you're going to feel impatient to get on with that every week because of how wonderful this book is. And the story starts off uh, with three young women and three young men, and also with a detail of 18th century British real estate law. <laughs> uh, the three young women are three of the five daughters of Mr. Bennett, uh, a kindly country, country gentleman who has an estate at Longbourn. Uh, he has five daughters. The oldest is Jane. The oldest and the prettiest is Jane. Next is Elizabeth, who is smart and who shares her father's sarcastic sense of humor. And then the three younger sisters are Kitty, who's basically a non-entity, uh, Mary, who's a bit of a pill uh, and a bit pretentious, and Lydia, uh, who is, uh, to an unwise degree, a flirt, to, uh, to a degree that is going to cause major problems in the book. A flirt. <laughs> Those are the three. It, it, we don't really concern ourselves with Kitty, and we don't really concern ourselves with Mary, although God knows legions of later novelists have. We mainly concern ourselves with three of those daughters. Jane, Lizzie, and Lydia. And we also concern ourselves with three young men. Uh, the first is Mr. Bingley, who is rich. He's, he's wealthy. He has 5,000 pounds a year at a time when, when that was an astronomical amount of money. And he enters the story in the very first chapter because he has decided to lease Netherfield Hall a stately home near to Longbourn, uh, and in a small in a small uh, country county, the advent of a young man of marriageable age is a big deal, heralded by the novel's famous first line: "It is a truth universally acknowledged that a man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife." Mrs. Bennet, Mr. Bennet's long-suffering wife, has five daughters, none of whom are married. She's desperate to, to make sure that they are well-situated in life at a time when it was absolutely essential in order for that to be true that they marry, and preferably marry well. Uh, Mr. Bingley is the first of the young men. He's, he's pleasant and bluff and open-minded and happy, uh, and that can't be said, none of it, <laughs> for his friend Mr. Darcy, who's the second young man we're talking about, who is handsome but in a stern way. Uh, off-puttingly proud and distant, and very much richer than Mr. Bingley. If Mr. Bingley worth easily twice as much as Mr. Bingley. Uh, and the third young man that we want to talk about, who's connected with both of these first two, and who also affects our story dramatically, is a young man named Mr. Wickham, who is part of a local militia. Keep in mind, Jane Austen, when Jane Austen wrote this book, England was at war with France. And there were militia companies encamped all throughout the island. England was never invaded, so they, they weren't ever really called upon to do much, which got them into trouble. Uh, they became automatically objects of social and romantic fascination for the whole of the county near around where they were encamped, especially if it was someplace out of the way, uh, like the countryside that we're dealing with here. Uh, the younger Bennett girls are totally infatuated. Kitty and, and Lydia are totally infatuated with the various officers of the various militia groups <laughs> that, are, that are near to them in the town of Merrington. Uh, and one of those is Mr. Wickham, a young man who looks very dashing in uniform and who we are told is, Jane Austen doesn't use this term, but even great authors have limitations, a super hottie. <laughs> uh, Mr. Darcy is also handsome, but he's handsome in a more forbidding way. But Mr. Wickham is a teen dream. Uh, and it's those three young men and those three young women that break this novel into its its uh, initial, you know, courses. 
because Mr. Bingley comes to Netherfield Hall, and he brings Mr. Darcy with him. Mr. Wickham is encamped at Meryton, so he is also in the orbit of the Bennet girls. And Mr. Wickham immediately wants to hold a dance, uh, which is a big deal, uh, because that's how young women are presented to the young men who might end up marrying them. Certainly it's a big deal to Mrs. Bennet, who makes who implores Mr. Bennet right away, go and pay your respects to Mr. Bingley, make sure that you make a good impression, we want we want something to come of this. Uh, we want at least one of our daughters to marry as a result of this. Mr. Bennett doesn't take pretty much anything seriously at this point in the book. He is, he is uh, mostly just looking at the world as an absurd place that's food for his sarcasm. But he nevertheless pays Mr. Bingley a call because at, at heart he knows the basic truth of the matter, which is that if they, they, the Bennets are not rich enough to go to London for the season. So if they don't find a husband in the local area, they won't find a husband at all. And in the, in, keep in mind, in 1813, that was crucial. That was absolutely crucial. Uh, and the, you, you're, you're thinking, okay, well, it sounds like we've got a great, a great premise for uh, a relationship comedy, maybe, uh, maybe a, normal, a normal novel of the time. But why did you mention real estate law? <laughs> and there's a reason why I did. I mentioned the real estate law because the, uh, the estate at Longbourn is entailed. And Mr. Bennett only has daughters. The estate is entailed. It has to be p passed on to a male heir. And since Mr. Bennett doesn't have a male heir, they are going to lose their home. The Bennett family is going to lose its home. When Mr. Bennett dies, Longbourn will pass on to his cousin, Mr. Collins, who's a, a county over and who is an obsequious, supercilious uh, churchman, uh, <laughs> who's... The, the idea that he will one day inherit their beloved home is outrageous to Mrs. Bennet, not least which because she will then be dependent on his goodwill. Where is she going to go when he takes over Longbourn? He's going to move in with his family. Uh, he doesn't have a family at the moment. When we meet him in this book, he is looking for a wife. Uh, and he's looking in a very particular place. <laughs> he sends a letter uh, to Mr. Bennet saying that... that whatever happened between our older relatives, now that I am the heir, now that I, that now that Longbourn will come to me, I see no reason why we can't be friends. Uh, may I come and visit? Uh, and he does. He, and, and in the course of his visit, it turns out that he is enraptured, an enraptured sycophant of Lady Catherine de Bourgh, uh, who he never ceases to praise, and who is connected to Mr. Darcy. She is, she is uh, his most formidable elderly relative. <laughs> uh, so you see that in, even in the first 15 chapters, we come into a tightly woven web of a plot. And the neat thing about it, uh, for me, at least this time around, and I'm dying to hear, I'm going to, I, once again, in this first read along, I'm going to go short on meta commentary and long on plot summary, because in the first one, I really want to hear from you. We'll, we'll talk about the book plenty in the next three weeks. But this time around, I really want to hear what your first impressions were, especially those of you who have not read this before. Uh, but the thing that struck me this time around, it struck me before, I've, I've read this novel I don't know how many times, and I've taught it as well. And the thing that always strikes me is uh, the incredible balancing act that Jane Austen pulls off between giving us a from a standing, star, a standing still start for the book, which is Bingley coming to Netherfield, that is something new. That is something that 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 has happened right here. That starts the book. There's that, but Jane Austen incredibly well balances that with a feeling of just plopping you into an already existing world, which I think accounts for why not only Pride and, has Pride and Prejudice had innumerable pastiches. People read it want to go back to Longbourn. They want to go back to Meryton. They want to go back into this world. Not only does that account for all of those pastiches. But also, <laughs> it accounts for the entire subgenre of Regency romances, all of which go back to this book. None of them go back to Mansfield Hall. Oh, Mansfield, they don't go back to Sensibility. They don't go back to Emma. They go back to this book. They might say that they don't. You, oh my god, barely talk to a Regency romance author, especially from 30 years ago, when Regencies were, uh, do I have, yeah, I want to have, when Regencies were these uh, very much Pride and Prejudice things. 
as opposed to the sex romps that they are today. If you go back to any of those old Regency authors, they will tell you one and all that they love Pride and Prejudice, and that they're essentially writing Pride and Prejudice. The, the pattern is laid down, right down to the finer, finer details. The, the heroine is always, like Lizzie Bennet, not conventionally beautiful. Pretty, but not beautiful in the way that Jane is beautiful. The protagonist, the Mr. Darcy character, is always off on the wrong foot the way Mr. Darcy is. He makes a terrible first impression. Even to Mrs. Bennet, when the, when uh, Netherfield Hall finally has its its dance and all and everybody meets everybody else, uh, Mr. Darcy makes such a bad impression that even Mrs. Bennet doesn't like him, even though she knows how wealthy he is. She, you, you know, at the beginning of the book, she's talking about how if she could just see her daughters well married, she would be happy. Well, Mr. Darcy is the definition of well married, and she wants she won't hear anything about him. He's rude. <laughs> and that's that's just awful. She doesn't she uh she gets a bad rap. We're going to talk about Mrs. Bennett quite a bit in this upcoming month. I think she gets a bad rap and I don't think she's the only one. I think there's a clearly observable pattern going on in this book. Be interested to know what you think. I'm not going to prejudice your reading this early on. But one way or another, Mrs. Bennett says if only she could get all of her daughters well married, she'd be happy. And yet she doesn't consider Mr. Darcy even once she knows that he is off-putting. She doesn't consider him to be prior. All of her attention is on Mr. Bingley. And at the dance, Mr. Bingley shows a marked appreciation for Jane. They hit it off in the idiom of a later age. They hit it off. And later on in the 15 chapters that we're reading, uh, Jane is caught in the rain. She gets soaked to the skin. And she finds herself at Netherfield. And Bingley and all of his friends are gathered there. They're encamped there for their stay in the country. But Jane takes ill. It's, it's not anything major, probably just a head cold or chills. Uh, but she can't travel. She can't leave Netherfield. Uh, so she's forced on their hospitality. And when, when Lizzie finds that out, she tramps across country in her dress to see if she can be of any help, to see if she can sit with her, with her sister on her sickbed. And uh, Mr. Bingley is wonderful. He is a wonderful person. He, he sees immediately the sisterly devotion of that act and loves it. His friends, <laughs> not so much. They are not so much. They're, they're a mean-spirited and, and gossipy crowd of, of shallow creatures. And they don't like what they see at all. Elizabeth, Elizabeth Bennet is clearly a country woman. She, is, she has mud on her dress. She's walked across country. Who does that? <laughs> but they, uh, they have nothing but unkind words for her. And the, it sets up a tension. The, the, we've already seen tension between her and that group, and especially between her and Mr. Darcy. They have pointed words a couple of times in the chapters that we're reading today uh, that I don't know. I'm curious to know if you, those of you who are reading this book for the first time, when you see those words, do you have any idea what's coming? You of course do because Pride and Prejudice is in the cultural bloodstream. It's been adapted a million times to TVs, to movies, to comic books, uh, to pastiche, pastiche novels, like I mentioned, are everywhere. So you probably know the rough outline of Lizzie Bennet and Mr. Darcy, but even so, how did it strike you this first time around? In fact, I'll wrap up this, this first week, because that's where we end things. We end things with those three people. Those, those three people are now poised to move the plot around themselves. There's Jane, there's Lizzie, there's Lydia, not prominent in these early chapters. There's Mr. Darcy, there's Mr. Bingham, uh, Bingley, and there's Mr. Wickham. Uh, and there's an end tale. And there's Mr. Collins, who's coming to visit. And there's Lady Catherine de Bourgh ho hovering in the background. We're going to get to meet all these people. We're going to get to know them very well in the upcoming chapters. But it's amazing how much ground we cover in these first 15. The book is well and truly started in these first 15 chapters. And I, even rereading it this time for the thousandth time, was totally hooked at chap chapter 15. <laughs> and now I want to know. I want to know in this first week read on what you were. Did you feel it? Did you feel the magic of you coming at this for the first time? And you know, I'm also curious to know, quite a few of you have said uh, that you're coming at this again, that you've read it before, usually once, and that now you'll be rereading it. And I'm curious to know those reactions as well. Time has passed. No author that I know of benefits time passing, benefits more from time passing than Jane Austen. The more you come back to her and reread her, the more you realize how much of her game she understood how much she understood that you did not of what she was doing when you read her the first time. Huh. And uh, I'm curious to know if that's happening. Uh, and also, 
as an indulgence to me, you're indulging me anyway, but as an indulgence to me in the comments field when we talk about Pride and Prejudice this time around, I promise I won't ask every week. I'd love to know what edition you're using. No, nothing hoity-toity. Nothing snobbish or anything like that. There is no right or wrong edition. You don't need any notes for this book. Even now, 200 years later, you don't need any notes for this book. Uh, I, I almost never use them. And I have I have two annotated Pride and Prejudices. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, not so much that as in terms of what does your Pride and Prejudice look like. I wish we could put pictures in the comments field. What does your Pride and Prejudice look like? What paperback or hardcover or edition are you using? When I was rereading these first 15 chapters, I was using this battered old penguin that has been in the mud. It has been moved from room to room by a fat basset hound. But I was also <laughs> alternating sometimes between this behemoth, because it's March of the Mammoths for March. And this thing is a thousand pages long. This is the complete novels and, and you know, Pride and Prejudice is in there. So I've sort of been alternating between the two depending on what I felt like having in my hand. But as you can see, this, this Penguin Classic has been with me for a long time. <laughs> I've used it a lot. I, it's very convenient. And I love Penguin Classics more than any other reprint. So it was going to be a Penguin Classic. But I'm curious now about you. A little Signet Classic? Did you get a copy from the library? Do you have a nice, pretty hardcover? I'd love to hear that in addition to all of your impressions about the, these first 15 chapters. Now, next week, we'll move straight on to the next 15 chapters, and we'll talk a lot more about the the meaning of what we're seeing. I, 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 like to, I like to phase that in, not at the first, but as we're going along. So we have the book underneath us a bit. So I'll, we'll reconvene next Sunday for the next 15 chapters of Pride and Prejudice, uh, and I will see you then. Thank you, book two.